Thank you, sir. It's a, my honor again to introduce Dr. Dennis Holmes. Dr. Holmes is currently serving as interim director of the Margie Peterson Breast Center at St. John's Health Center. And he formerly held positions of chief breast surgeon and medical director at the Los Angeles Center for Women's Health and chief breast cancer surgeon and breast cancer research committee co-chair at the University of Southern California and Kenneth Norris, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. As a member of the Education Committee of the American Society of Breast Surgeons, Dr. Holmes recently led the development of a national surgical practice guidelines for the use of pre-op chemotherapy prior to breast cancer surgery. He currently serves as national co-chair of the Target US Registry Clinical Trial. He's a fellow of the American College of Surgeons and was also recently selected as board chair and president of the Target Collaborative Group, a national research and educational organization. Widely respected by colleagues and patients for his innovative approach to breast cancer care, please welcome Dr. Dennis Holmes. Good afternoon, everyone. I was wondering why I was asked to give this presentation. Barry has so much more experience with complications than I do that I thought he'd be a much more appropriate presenter. <laughs> but really, the, the inspiration was actually a, a presentation that was a paper that was published last year, 2016. I actually can't see that <laughs> projector, but it reads, short-term complications in intraoperative radiotherapy for early breast cancer. This is a single institution study of 395 patients, one year follow-up reporting out the complication rate, and it reported a remarkable 27% complication rate. In fact, one of my colleagues said that, the, that he had recently received a denial for coverage for intraoperative therapy based upon this paper. The insurance companies cited this as a reason not to authorize the procedure. So this is quite alarming. I hadn't seen the paper, hadn't reviewed the paper, so I read it and I, then I wrote to the editor and I said, I hope you're well. I have some serious concerns about the findings of this paper. I would like to write a commentary. I have several concerns, not the least of which is the fact that the authors count grade one asymptomatic and grade two seromas requiring one aspiration among the 27% complication rate and made no distinction between asymptomatic and symptomatic seromas. And in addition, report an 8% wound dehiscence rate, which I thought was an outlier in the APBI field. Fortunately, he was uh, willing to uh, allow me to write a, uh, an invited editorial, which was subsequently published and, and is available online. And so in the presentation that I'll give, I'd like to really discuss various aspects of this uh, paper, as well as uh, some of the complications that have been reported by the TARGET trial. This slide you've seen before, so clinically significant complications from the TARGET A trial. Uh, in particular, focused on seroma, wound dehiscence, and breakdown, infection, until angiectasia and fibrosis. Uh, speak briefly about cardiac pulmonary side effects or complications and fat necrosis. So, seroma is a, is a is a ch interesting uh, phenomenon. Obviously, we've thought for many years that the seroma was a surgeon's friend, and somehow it now ends up on the complication list. I'm not quite sure how that happened. Uh, but seroma is a, a normal side effect of wound healing. Sometimes it can be excessive, but it is, pre it is present in every single wound that we create within the body, certainly within the breast. Now, in the target trial, the key question here was how many patients required more than three aspirations of their seroma? And so that's really the endpoint that we're showing. And in, in, it was, in fact, higher in the APBI or target group than it was in the whole breast group, 2.1 versus 0 0.8. But this is a phenomenon that we see throughout APBI, that seromas are more common with APBI. Overall, the, the number of patients requiring more than three aspirations was low, but it was higher in the target group compared to the whole breast radiotherapy group. When you look at the publication uh, the, by Zur, I'll just refer to it as a Zur publication, they reported a 10.1% seroma rate, which you see uh, marked off there. And, all of those were either grade one or grade two, which means that at least a portion of them were asymptomatic. So I'm not quite sure why they would count it as a complication if a portion of them were asymptomatic lesions. Uh, nonetheless, that's, num that's part of where that 27% came from. Now, if you look at seroma grading, it says that a grade one seroma is an asymptomatic seroma. Uh, palpable but asymptomatic. We don't do anything about those. Those, those, are the, those, those seromas are the, the classic seroma that's your friend. 
Symptomatic seroma are ones that re uh, grade one, sorry, grade two are those that require one aspiration or is palpable and symptomatic, but neither of these would have actually met criteria for the target trial. I mean, we only measured in the target trial those that required at least three aspirations. So seromas were present, but for the most part, I think they were fairly unremarkable in that paper, but still they were considered to be complications and justified denial of, that, of patients, uh, may have justified denial of patients for uh, coverage. Now, if you look at uh, what may have contributed to seroma formation, one curious finding in the study was that uh, they use relatively large applicators for the patients. In fact, about 85% of the patients had applicators that were use of 4.5 to 5 centimeters. Uh, now, among my criticisms of the paper is that they did not discuss the surgical techniques, so I don't know if they were oncoplastic techniques or standard lumpectomy procedures, uh, but nonetheless, 4.5 to 5% 5 applicators is certainly more than the 3.5 that was just discussed. And in fact, if you look at the target trial, the average applicator size in the target trial was between 3.5 and 4 centimeters. So there was something different about their technique that led to larger applicator use. When you look at my own series, this is a series of just 100 patients treated with uh, IRT in, in my practice. Looking at 100 patients, the average applicator size was 3.78%. So definitely closer to that 3.5. If you look at the Cleveland Clinic experience, it was 3.7 centimeters, almost the exact same number. So definitely there are differences in technique that were used among the surgeons publishing that paper than is used in Barry's practice, my practice, and I suppose many of your practice as well. Uh, so maybe the larger cavity size contributed to stroma formation. It certainly would do so. You would think it would do so. But I think the fact that you know they had much larger size applicators for tumors that were, in this paper, generally under two centimeters, suggested that they were probably making, creating larger cavities that needed to be created. So in thinking about seroma and perhaps seroma reduction, first of all, recognize it's a normal phenomenon after surgery. You should expect it at least to some degree. Uh, they may require an aspiration or two, and sometimes in a minority of patients will require more than three aspirations. Uh, they, are the ones that were tracked in a target trial, but most of your patients will fall below that threshold. It may be helpful to minimize cavity size, just as I discussed. Um, if you perform oncoplastic surgery, or even if you don't, full cavity closure may be helpful in reducing the potential space for seroma accumulation. Uh, and I just added the comment that, you know, you can have a seroma that originates from the breast. If you have an adjacent axillary wound, you can have a seroma that, that originates or develops there as well. So if you can keep the two cavities apart, it may be helpful in minimizing the degree to which the fluid accumulation will become symptomatic. The next kind of topic to discuss is wound dehiscence and breakdown. Now, if you look at the target trial, the target A trial, the skin breakdown was 2.8% in the RT group, 1.8% in the whole breast radiotherapy group. The difference was not statistically significant. If you look at the paper by Zur, they had a an overall 8.1% wound dehiscence rate, 7.5% were grade one or two, and 0.5% were grade three or four. Uh, and I think uh, earlier today, uh, Dr. Vinci mentioned that there was about a 5.5% uh, rate in the target retrospective, which is still, I think, a bit high, but not as high as what was reported for the Zur group. Now, one of the factors contributing to wound uh, complications, wound dehiscence, for example, is the applicator to skin distance. And this is actually a, a part of a publication by uh, Frederick Vince, who indicated that a safe margin distance, that is, applicator to skin distance, was five millimeters or greater. Many of us aim for much more than that, but it's important to at least make sure that you can maintain a minimum distance of five millimeters. There are several ways to achieve that. Use of a purse string suture can be uh, can uh, is a way to manage a distance. If the, if the uh, tissue, uh, the applicator is too close to the skin, you can place an the, the purse string suture at a le lower depth in the breast to increase the distance between the applicator and the skin. Uh, you can also resect the skin immediately over the applicator if you cannot maintain sufficient skin distance. You can use skin retractors is shown here as well, to retract the skin edges away from the applicator uh, sphere. Uh, I'm making a distinction that you're in this, that you're retracting the applicators from the sphere because there's no radiation that comes from the shaft itself, so the goal isn't to protect that. But you see that the radiation can, be, can leave the breast and 
traverse through the breast tissue and to the skin if the skin isn't withdrawn away where the skin approaches the applicator sphere. So this re basically represents that image, that phenomenon. Uh, it is helpful uh, at the time of surgery to perform ultrasound to document the skin distance. You can also document the conformity of the breast tissue to the applicator, but confirming that you have at least five millimeters of distance between the applicator surface and the skin is one way to be confident that that distance isn't too narrow. Uh, again, if you look at the same uh, group of 100 patients that I described a moment ago, using ultrasound, I was able to demonstrate an average applicator surface distance of 10 millimeters. Uh, and most patients uh, had numbers that were uh, uh, in that range, with only a few of them actually, uh, sorry, I can't use the pointer here, sorry. These have about five or seven millimeters. Only a minority of patients that even were close to five millimeters. Most were well uh, more than five millimeter skin distance. So I think that can be easily accomplished, and I basically accomplished that by managing the skin the applicator distance with the use of the purse string suture. So in terms of preventing wound dehiscence, these are some considerations that you may want to um, uh, bring to the procedure. Number one, aim for an applicator skin distance that's, great, that's greater than five millimeters. Use a purse string suture to manage the distance. Verify the distance by ultrasound. Consider resection of the skin if it's too superficial, if the lesion is too su superficial. Barry suggested that skin undermining is beneficial. I actually oppose skin undermining, but if you're performing an oncoplastic procedure, obviously there's a lot of skin undermining with that procedure, but you know, undermining the skin in order to increase the distance may devitalize the skin edges and increase the risk for wound dehiscence. So if you can keep the skin attached to the breast tissue and simply use a purse string suture to bring the breast parenchyma to the applicator, but retract the skin edges with the suture, you can basically achieve what you want to achieve without devitalizing the skin edges. Infection. In the target trial, there was no significant difference between the intraoperative therapy arm and the whole breast radiotherapy arm in the infection rate. And the number was low, about 1% to 2%. In the ZER study, the number was about 10% of patients had infection. 7.5 had grade one or two, and 3% had grade three or four infection. So again, why did they have a much higher infection rate? I don't really have the answer because they didn't really describe that surgical technique, but certainly if they were creating larger cavities, that may have contributed to it to some degree. If you look at the Medicare database, comparing brachytherapy to whole breast radiotherapy to mammocyte, you see that a 10% false, neg a 10 uh, infection rate is actually pretty much in line with what most studies have reported. Uh, severe infections, those that require IV antibiotics, are at a, at a generally a lower rate, uh, about 2% for the target trial. Retrospective was 3.6% from earlier today. Med Medicare database brachytherapy was about 1%. Whole breast radiotherapy, 1.4%. So 10% is still a little bit high, but it's in keeping with what we see across breast conserving surgery, regardless of the approach that you take. And really only a minority of patients should require IV antibiotics. What we see again in the target trial is about one to two percent. Their study was about three percent. But I think that if you look at the ZER study and not compare it to what we normally achieve with whole breast radiotherapy, you may uh, walk away thinking that the infection rate in that study and the complication rate in that study is particularly high for this procedure. So I think if you find yourself engaged in any of these conversations about the ZER study, make sure that they understand what we would normally expect for breast, breast conservation, uh, number one, and also make sure that they understand that a seroma should not be considered uh, to the same degree as uh, uh, like an infection or uh, wound dehiscence because uh, it actually is just a normal side effect of breast conserving surgery. Backscatter. Uh, when intraoperative therapy is given, radiation can be emitted from the breast and this blue uh, curved uh, item here uh, suggests that a radiation barrier has been placed on the surface of the breast. You can see that radiation may be emitted from the breast, uh, impact the radiation barrier, and then bounce back to provide a double exposure of the skin. That phenomena of the radiation bouncing off with the shield onto the skin is called backscatter, and what it can give is sort of a double hit that can overexpose or increase the dose to the skin, producing skin erythema and potentially increasing the risk of uh, wound breakdown. Uh, we use barriers quite commonly in the procedure, but it is helpful if you increase the distance between the barrier and the skin to minimize that backscatter phenomenon. 
I typically want to place the uh, barrier in a way that it's conical instead of flat. And I also use a, a moistened lap pad in order to decrease the distance and also attenuate the radiation that it released that leaves the breast so that any radiation bouncing back towards the breast is further minimized. Uh, so in terms of infection prevention, again, uh, the infection rates are comparable across breast conservation. Uh, most of us you follow SKIP guidelines, at least we should, with the, making sure that patients receive chemo uh, antibiotics within an hour of surgery. Uh, we don't generally feel that oral antibiotics is required after all patients undergoing breast conserving surgery, uh, but some of us may choose to use it. It's really physician preference. But it's important to recognize that backscatter may be misinterpreted as infection. So if you're finding yourself sort of inclined to use antibiotics because you're concerned that patients may have a low-grade infection after RT, it might be backscatter that you're witnessing. And so you may reduce the erythema that normally that you may be seeing by, uh, by improving the distance between the shield, the external shield that you place on the breast and the skin surface. Telangiectasia and fibrosis. Uh, this is what the target trial found. Uh, low rates, but it was statistically higher uh, in the whole breast radiotherapy arm than the interop arm. Uh, that same paper that I mentioned before by Frederick Vince pointed out that if you can increase the distance between the uh, applicator and the skin, you can minimize telangiectasia and fibrosis. Uh, he represented that graphically on this slide, showing that uh, if you uh, looking at fibrosis, telangiectasia, edema, retraction, hyperpigmentation, and pain, and found that if you uh, that the timing of uh, radiotherapy delivery mattered, and that the skin distance also mattered. Uh, in this in this particular uh, example, he found that if you deliver uh, whole breast radiotherapy, particularly, if in, and this is particularly relates, relates to a patient that requires a boost after. Uh, that, that requires whole breast after a boost. If you delay the external beam dose for more than 40 days, then you minimize fibrosis, telangiectasia, and other side effects. And that red area that you see on the slide really shows the, the first 40 days after treatment. And you can see the, the amount of events that happens uh, uh, within that time frame. So treatment given, whole breast given within 40 days had many more adverse events than those given beyond the first 40 days. So the recommendation is therefore to start whole breast radiotherapy after interrupt by uh, at least uh, 36 days, uh, and that will allow you to minimize uh, the side effects, uh, fibrosis and telangiectasia, in particular following the combination of uh, IRT boost combined with whole breast radiotherapy. There's also a question about the timing of whole breast radiotherapy with respect to chemotherapy. Uh, there really isn't much published about this. I know that'll be a question that's looked in in a target boost trial, but what we do have is some guidance from the Mammocyte Registry, which found that there was worse cosmesis and greater radiation recall when chemotherapy was initiated less than three weeks after, whole breast, uh, after uh, completing IRT, or in that case, after, a, after receiving the Mammocyte treatment. So the thought is that if you can if you want to look for some guidelines or guidance regarding the appropriate timing of chemotherapy after IRT, this paper would suggest that you should wait at least three weeks before initiating chemotherapy in the patient that does require it. Uh, so in summary, uh, in terms of preventing telangiectasias and fibrosis, uh, you should maintain applicator distance, again, greater than five millimeters, initiate whole breast radiotherapy at least five weeks after intraoperative therapy boost, and initiate chemotherapy at least three weeks after APBI and likely after IRT as well. Cardiac pulmonary risk, we've talked about this um, a bit and I don't have a lot to share about it, but I think that it's a, it helps to, to be aware of this slide which, uh, which really compares multiple methods of delivering breast radiotherapy and looks at the dose to the heart and lung uh, based upon the modality, you see that if you look at all the curves, and this is this about this graph here, so the upper uh, right shows a magnification of the graph. You see that the purple and the light blue bar represents the heart exposure to intraoperative therapy and the ipsilateral lung exposure, and basically says that the at the level of the heart and the lung with a target, 
there's almost no uh, radiation delivery to the heart and lung. And it speaks to the, 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 the fact that for most patients undergoing target, use of a radiation barrier is not needed because of the attenuation of the breast tissue and the chest wall. Uh, so in general, it's not needed. Uh, it can be used under certain circumstances, and I have uh, one of my radiation oncologists does have some concerns about the absorption uh, of uh, radiation uh, to bone, especially in patients that have a fairly deep lesion and adjacent to a rib. So I use an applicator in some of those cases. Uh, but it's curious in that paper, that is, in the Zura paper, that they had 32% of their patients using uh, with the use of a, a radiation shield, so uh, with an internal barrier. So it's not clear why they had such a high use of a radiation barrier in their cases. Again, were they dissecting more than needed, uh, which creates greater potential space, which creates potentially a greater risk of infection and so forth. Uh, I think most of us probably have a shield use of less than 10%. So there's something about their methods that uh, may have contributed to a higher complication rate. That's just an example of a radiation shield that was placed in the patient with a fairly thin breast that was treated with IRT, uh, and uh, it was a rather lateral lesion, so it was, it was radiation given basically right on top of the serratus and ribs. So I did use a shield in that case. Uh, I think the point has been made numerous times over that the cardiac benefits of IRT are, are obvious. There's less cardiac morbidity, so that emphasizes the point that use of radiation shield is unnecessary. The final topic is fat necrosis. Uh, uh, this was uh, not a data point reported out in, in the uh, target trial, but it is something that I looked at in a, pa in a paper several years ago where we looked at patients randomized in a target A trial to either whole breast radiotherapy or intraoperative radiotherapy. There were a total of 30 patients, half randomized to each arm, uh, and we had four years of follow-up mammograms on all patients. Uh, those imaging studies were provided to the radiologist who was blinded to the treatment. He, he was asked to grade uh, the mammograms based upon the follow following features, architectural distortion, skin thickening, skin retraction, calcifications, fat necrosis, and mass density to determine uh, the, the frequency of these events uh, amongst the patients uh, reviewed. Uh, what we found is that there was really one, only one difference uh, that was uh, marginally significant between the two study groups, intraop and whole breast, and that was fat necrosis, primarily oil cysts. Calcifications occurred in both groups. It did not reach statistical significance. Oral cysts, which are shown here on the mammographic image, were more common in the intraoperative therapy group. The bottom line is that the mammographic features uh, of IRT did not impair mammographic detection or screening. Uh, no patients were advised to have additional biopsies or procedures based upon the mammographic effects of, of IRT. And it just confirmed that we were offering the treatment that was not only safe, but that did, that did not appear future mammographic detection of breast cancer. Uh, and regarding uh, management of fat necrosis, the basic point is that it's usually microscopic, not macroscopic. It may also appear as a, as, as a tan liquid that almost looks like pus. I didn't discuss this in the presentation, but Veronese has described a thick fluid that's sterile that is an example of fat necrosis typically seen in fatty breasts. Uh, fat necrosis generally does not limit imaging follow-up. Uh, the risk is greater in fatty breasts, so unless I'm performing an oncoplastic procedure, I tend to m minimize mobilization because I want to minimize fat necrosis. Again, that speaks to uh, the rationale behind avoiding undermining the skin, if you can, and minimizing tissue mobilization in the fatty breast. So in summary, these are just some of the highlights of the things that I've discussed. Uh, number one, you should anticipate seroma formation and recognize that a few patients will require multiple aspira aspirations, but that's okay. Uh, be thoughtful about the skin distance and use ultrasound and skin uh, and purse string placement to maximize the skin to applicator distance. Uh, be careful with the use of the external barrier. At least make sure that you protect the skin to minimize backscatter. For patients that require whole breast radiotherapy after a target boost, it's best to delay the whole breast radiotherapy treatment for five weeks. For chemotherapy patients, delay the chemotherapy treatment for three weeks. Uh, chest wall shielding may be needed, but it's generally not needed. Uh, fat necrosis can happen, but it's not a particular problem for further uh, mammographic screening. And lastly, minimize tissue mobilization when you're not performing an oncoplastic procedure because it will minimize the risk of fat necrosis and perhaps seroma formation. Thank you very much.